Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this one I'm going to call Uncharted Territory because I'm seeing a lot of things now that are unprecedented, and it's very difficult for me to predict what's going to happen based on past precedent. Now, this is just one example. This chart is the Chinese yuan US dollar. I normally show you the US dollar Chinese yuan, but for comparison purposes, I went ahead and put up the CNY USD because I wanted to compare it to crude oil. This is a crude oil WTI contract. So the first thing we want to note here is that the financial crisis, which was marked by this, this line here, was uh, something that didn't really impact the um, direction of the Chinese currency. Now, it did impact it in the velocity of its direction because you can see that it actually flatlined from about mid-2008 through mid-2010. So a good two-year two period that the Chinese currency didn't move against the U.S. dollar. Now, prior to that period of time, uh, as the price of oil was rising, and we can see that 150 peak, that very famous 150 peak that oil hit uh, and then crashed all the way down to 35 bucks. Um, while it was rising, it was accompanied by a rise in the value of the Chinese currency. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because when we're talking about China, we're talking about basically the world's manufacturer. And uh, We've talked about trade balances and trade deficits and the value of currencies and how things like that work. And there's two things that you need to consider when you're talking about the value of your currency and your balance of trade. You need to consider the prices that you get for your exports, which is determined by who you're competing against and how weak your currency is, but you also have to think about the prices of your imports. So you can see here, as the price of oil was rising, the value of the Chinese currency was rising. China pretty much didn't uh, have, wasn't really impacted for two years there because uh, yes, oil became very expensive, but also their currency uh, was rising. So very interestingly, you can see right at the point when oil peaked and collapsed, that's when the Chinese currency flatlined. Now, they had a period here where they went from having uh, very expensive oil to very, very cheap oil, cheaper than anyone because their currency stayed steady. Uh, then as oil began to recover, you can see finally at the end of that two-year period, the Chinese currency resumed its long uptrend and began again to rise in value along with the price of oil. Uh, the Chinese currency continued to outpace oil, relatively speaking, until about this top here in 2014. And this is the big turnaround that we had in the Chinese currency. Now my prediction at the time was that the Chinese currency would uh, continue to rise and that this was just a short-term blip and I thought it would just keep going the direction that it was going. Now we can see that things have changed dramatically. We know that uh, the events of last summer happened and uh, the Chinese did a sudden devaluation of their currency. It looks like if we, pull, if we look at this weekly um, candlestick here, they're going to be doing more. But uh, uh, this direction of the Chinese currency was not something I anticipated and I certainly did not anticipate this collapse in the price of oil. So now we're seeing something completely different. Uh, this for me again is uncharted territories. We're looking at the value of the Chinese currency going down as the price of oil is plummeting. 
Now, that's important for the Chinese because if you think about it, the Chinese are beginning to enter a slowdown. I, I'm not sure how serious that slowdown is, but if we look at commodity prices, it seems to be a fairly serious slowdown. It may be that the Chinese have built out as much infrastructure as they can digest for the next number of years, and they've just slowed down building their ghost cities that are soon to be inhabited. Or maybe there's some type of Chinese strategy behind this, and, and that's actually what I'm thinking. But if you look at this, you can see that now that the price of oil has basically completely collapsed, and you can see the divergence here between these two prices, uh, there's no reason why the Chinese can't let their currency weaken because the price of oil has collapsed so much that they are able to get oil for a fraction of its price. And for all intents and purposes, uh, oil and other uh, commodities, whether it's the metals, iron ore, platinum, palladium, uh, even copper, gold, and silver, uh, possibly crops, anything, any commodity, um, the prices are falling dramatically. So the Chinese are actually in a position where they can let their currency uh, fall in value tremendously and it has very little impact upon their economy due to uh, the things they need to import, which are raw materials. So that's a very interesting phenomenon that's beginning to emerge. I have no idea what this is going to portend. It may actually be some huge uh, drop down in the Chinese currency. Now let's look at this Anglo-American story because this this was a big shocker for a lot of people. Uh, Anglo-American came out and announced that they were going to cut two-thirds of their workforce and that's huge. You can see here's the story on the right perspective. One of the world's largest mining companies announced Thursday it would cut 85,000 jobs or two-thirds of its workforce as lowering commodity prices cut into corporate profit. Shares in Anglo-American ended down by more than 11% on the news. The London-listed company, which has vast production facilities across Africa, said it would also sell huge chunks of of its business and suspend dividend payments for a year. Capital expenditures will also be cut by $1 billion. The company said it would be selling or closing down up to 35 of its mines. The collapse in prices for gold, copper, and iron ore has slashed profits at the firm. It marks the most aggressive restructuring since the economic crisis of 2008. Perhaps hardest hit in the downsizing will be South Africa. The country counts for almost half of Anglo-Americans' revenues with its global portfolio. Within the private sector, the mines in South Africa count for more than half a million jobs alone. So uh, this is a huge hit to South Africa. When I shorted their currency, I had no idea what the news was going to be, but uh, I knew that the miners were going to suffer tremendously with the suppressed price, and now we're starting to see the fallout of that with Anglo-American. Now let's look at the Anglo-American stock price. This is absolutely shocking. Anglo-American PLC, which is traded on the London Exchange, it's LON, uh, London Exchange AAL symbol. And you can see here, this chart, again, this is uncharted territories. This is nothing like we've ever seen before. Um, we're plumbing lows now that are far below the 2008 lows. And these lows are far below the 2000, early 2000 lows, which was the beginning of the gold bull market. Now we know that the gold bull market, based on the chart, isn't really even close to over yet. It's still a, a strong bull market. Um, it's not even a 50% pullback based on uh, this bottom here. If you draw the trend line, depending on how you draw it, uh, we're talking about a run from roughly $250 an ounce to $1,900 an ounce. 
and a pullback to a thousand. So comparing those two charts, looking at gold, which is in a bull market correction phase, uh, this company, Anglo American, this is a bankruptcy type of move here. Uh, this is a company that once traded at 3,500 per share. It's now down 310. It's down more than 90%. It's lost more than 90% of its value. So, and that's uh, 4.47 billion. That means at one point it was a 40 plus billion dollar company. And now it's a $4 billion company. What's going on here? Well, it's crazy. Uh, we, Like I said, we're in uncharted territories. Now, let's look at the silver price here because if we pull up the silver chart, you can see that we had, and this is something I've been predicting. I'm not saying that it's over with by any means, but this is something that I've been predicting is these choppy drops down into new lows. Um, where you're not going to get the low prices that, that are printed on the screen. We're still there with the premiums on physical silver. Uh, they're just not really falling the way we would expect them to fall. If we go to the compare silver prices chart, you can see that uh, the best buy for silver right now is going to be these 10 ounce bars. and you know my preference. I do not like bars at all, and I certainly don't like 10 ounce bars, but right now there's just nothing that I like. Uh, with, with silver trading at a price of below $14, you can see here across the top, uh, we're talking about $17 there, 16 and a half, 16. Here's Buffalo's for $14.79, that's not bad. Uh, then there's those bars. So really the only thing that's even tempting is the just the generics. Now the reason why I'm not very tempted by that is because I have bought the generics in the past. Actually this coin right here I bought in 2008 and I remember what I paid. I paid exactly $12.50 an ounce which was roughly $4 above spot for that coin back in 2008. And I can tell you the appreciation on my one ounce buffaloes does not compare to the appreciation on the Perth Mint Lunars and other coins that I bought at that time. So uh, it's tempting, but it's really not that tempting. There's just not really anything out there to act on for me. Uh, I'm still watching the half ounce monkeys. The one ounce monkeys are drifting lower. But when you're talking about a price of, of around 22 to 23 bucks for a one ounce coin, when we've got a silver spot price at 14, that's just too much premium to, to stomach. So what's going on here? Well, uh, we need to look at the supply and demand situation. The uh, chart that I often show you from the Silver Institute and you can see that the mine production has steadily risen. The mine production for 2015, uh, my prediction is going to be it, it's going to be another record. And how it's possible that we can continue to have record mine production as we are watching a collapse in commodity prices and uh, the, the companies that mine those commodities uh, how those two things can happen at the same time, uh, I, I just I can't even figure it out. Uh, again, it, it's uncharted. We're in a new area. So I have no explanation. We'll just have to wait and see how it shakes out. Last chart is going to be the uh, Bitcoin chart. And that's uh, on the Chinese exchange. You can see that, again, here we're in uncharted territories for this volume. We've never seen anything like this. There's no explanation for this, except for the fact that the Chinese are coming into it. If we go to the the comparable Bitstamp um, chart, you can see that the, the volume is starting to rival the volume we had with that record run-up where Bitcoin ran from the $100 something to, it, it made a tenfold move. And we're nearing volume like that, 
but uh, on on the Chinese exchange, um, we're seeing volume. And again, people have have mentioned that it's hard to uh, determine whether these volume numbers are accurate. But uh, we're just seeing crazy volume coming in from China. Now, the the reason I tend to think that it's probably true is because uh, if you look at, for example, now we have reports that the Warren Buffett of China has essentially disappeared. He's been arrested by the government. And uh, th this is a, a pattern that repeats in China where billionaires are just disappeared. And that would definitely give a warning to everyone else in China. I think the saying they use is uh, uh, kill a goat to scare the monkeys or something like that. It's repeated on Zero Hedge. But basically it, it means to make an example of somebody. And they've been doing that on a regular basis. So it makes sense to me that if there is a vehicle where the Chinese can get their money out of the country and under some circumstances, if possible, get their bodies out of the country. Uh, once they're out of the country, they can get their relatives out there and they can uh, pull down their assets through cryptocurrencies. That's probably the explanation for why we're seeing this tremendous volume. So I'm thinking maybe this volume is actually real. If that's the case, then I'm going to have to stick by that $5,000 Bitcoin price in, in the near term. And I'm talking within the next one or two months. We'll see. So back to the silver price. Again, we're in uncharted territories. I'm not really making any decisions right now. It's a really sad situation where the best buy out there is the generic uh, bars and coins, ones that are my least favorite. I like junk silver a lot better. Of course, the premium on junk silver is still ridiculous at around 3 and $4. So we're just sitting and waiting to see what happens. And uh, I promise you it's going to be very exciting when it does. And we'll talk to you next time.